King Basenity once came to see the Buddha in the middle of the day. And the Buddha asked him, what have you been up to today? And in a remarkable display, <coughs> display of frankness, he said all the typical things of someone who's obsessed with power, consumed with a desire for more power. And the Buddha asked him, suppose someone were to, were to come from the east, a reliable person, saying that there's a huge mountain moving in from the east, crushing all living beings in its, in its path. Another reliable person were going to come from the south, saying there's a huge mountain moving in from the south, crushing all living beings in its path. Another person from the west, another person from the north, altogether four mountains moving in. In the face of this horrible destruction of life, and reflecting how rare it is to get a human breath, what would you do? And the king said, what else could I do but practice the Dharma? And the Buddha said, I tell you, aging, illness, and death are moving in, crushing all living beings in their path. What are you going to do? And the king has to say, well, what else should I do but practice the Dharma? This is a good conversation to reflect on. It points to the fact that the Dharma is timeless. We live in a time of turmoil, a time of disease. Yet the Dharma stays the same. It's not that we have one Dharma for when times are comfortable and easy and another one for when they're not. Because aging, illness, and death are moving in all the time. This fact is always relevant. As the Buddha said, when the sun rises in the morning, you should ask yourself, you could die today. You don't need a pandemic. You could simply get careless as you walk down the path, trip, fall. I knew someone one time who made a list of all the strange ways in which people die, and some of them seem so arbitrary. Are you ready to go? And the answer usually is no. Well, then you've got work to do. Exactly what is it that's keeping you from being ready? What are you holding on to? That's unskillful. Or well, what skillful qualities have you not yet developed? Well, work on those. And work on them now. When the Buddha talks about the importance of being in the present moment, you don't just be there. You get there so you can do work, because there's work to be done. Because just as death can be random, the things that come up in your mind can be random, and you can grab onto them very easily. Something you haven't thought of for years suddenly shows up, and simply the fact that you hadn't thought of it for years will compel you to go and look into it. We can imagine what it's going to be like when death comes and suddenly your whole life starts flashing before your eyes. And there are all kinds of events that could suddenly grab your attention. Have you trained the mind well enough so it's not going to be interested? It's not going to be waylaid by those things. If not, you know what you've got to do. You've got to work on your concentration, work on your mindfulness, work on your discernment. To make your discernment with, in line with the word the Buddha calls penetrating. He talks about discernment being penetrating discernment into how things arise and pass away. But it's not just watching them arise and pass away. Because you also have to see there's a variation there. There's a diversity there. Some things arise and they're good, skillful. Other things arise and they're not. And you want to learn how to discern which is which. Only then is your discernment really safe and useful. If you just see how things are rising and passing away, you're not seeing anything that anyone else hasn't seen. And people seeing a rising and passing away in the world can continue to do unskillful things and go in skillful places. 
It's when you see how you can give rise to skillful things and get them to stay. Now you can see unskillful things arising and get them to go away and not come back. That's when you've really seen something special. That means you have to learn how to take them apart. See what it is that sparks your desire to go for them. As we're saying today, when the Buddha talks about the origination of mind states, in some cases it's simply, well, there's contact. It's old karma. But then other times when he says, it's because of your desire. These things come and you welcome them. You relish them. You feed on them. Why? Giving the mind better food with concentration is going to help you with that. Because otherwise, anything comes up and you're hungry, you just go for it. But when you can satisfy some of your hunger with the concentration, then when other things come up and you feel tempted to go, you can begin to see, oh, this is why. And it's really not worth it. That's when your discernment becomes the kind of discernment that can protect you, when random things come up in the mind. And if your discernment gets really strong, then even when the body is weak, the mind can maintain its determination. It's not going to go there. And you see this happening in the mind, something that would ordinarily spark lust or anger or greed or fear, jealousy, resentment, whatever. These things would come up, and if they don't spark the, the emotion that they used to spark, and they say, now I've learned something important, something useful. Of course, there's no guarantee that you're totally safe from those things, but you practice this again and again and again. You don't have to count the number of times. You can't say, well, I've already contemplated X, I'm done with it. You have to be alive to the fact that it could come back and it could disturb you again. Years back when I was first coming back to the States, I was back east in a meditation center. And I was sitting talking to someone. And a woman came in. She said, quick, quick, I need a book on death contemplation. I took a retreat last year on death contemplation. I thought I'd taken care of the issue. And then last night when I was having a, a trip, I suddenly realized I was still afraid of death. Well, one retreat is not going to take care of things. It's something you've got to do again and again and again. But don't get tired of the doing. Because it, the only thing you'll have as you face death will be the skills you've developed in the mind. Everything else will leave you. And so as with any skill that takes time and requires practice, you do it again and again and again. And there will come a point, though, when something takes hold in the mind. There are moments, experiences, that radically change things inside. And where do they come from? They come from following the path, like we're doing right now, getting the mind concentrated, noticing where it's still creating unnecessary stress for itself, looking for the cause, learning to let go of the cause. You just keep at it, at it, at it. And something opens up at some point. That's when you know you're safe. That's when you know you're ready. Up to that point, you're not ready. You may manage to muddle through, but you really want to be confident that nothing can get the mind to fall. That's when you can face death with confidence. So we know that we're going to face death. It could come at any time. We don't know when. This pandemic is going to come in waves. Maybe we survive the first wave, but who knows about the second or the third? Or even if we survive all the waves of the pandemic, something else is going to get us. It's the nature of the body. Once it's born, it's going to have to die. And so we have to be prepared. And any 
knowledge and it helps us prepare in a way where we really can be confident it's something you really want to give a lot of time to. And that's the knowledge that the Buddha provides. How we can experience aging illness and death and not suffer from it and not do anything unskillful around it. That's the kind of knowledge that will keep us safe. <laughs>